Lord, when we open our eyes of faith to see, we see your goodness in so many ways. The kids that came back from Geneva last night were so filled with, with joy, if not with energy, after a really good week there. Thanks for the lessons they've learned, for the friends that they've made, for the experiences <coughs> they had, for some of them being able to leave home for a week for the very first time and found that wasn't as bad as they thought it might be. Thanks most of all that they just got to know you a lot better, grew in that relationship, had some seeds planted, some young sprouts watered. <coughs> Lord, we're grateful for what you will do this week at Cran Hill as well. For staff that's been trying to get a little rest the weekend before camp starts again. For the safety you give and for the bonding time that they have on the bus on the way down there. Again, Lord, for the way you will be there. We know that Geneva and Cran Hill have been such important places in the spiritual launching pad, the spiritual journey for so many of our kids through the years. Know that we're grateful for the work that you do and for the people you use, both those working behind the scenes, those doing prayer, those doing fundraising, those cutting the grass and cleaning the toilets, and, and those who are the direct staff working to share their faith. Open up your word and make it come more alive. Because you're a good God. And we're grateful for that. We're grateful for your goodness in creation as well. <coughs> for gardens that are fruitful. For crops and farmers' fields that are growing towards harvest. For quiet walks for days at the beach, for vacations that are restful, even though they're often very hectic and busy, for the beauty of the flowers, even in a drought year, for the singing of the birds, for the reminders all around us that you have given us a good creation and asked us to take care of it. But I know that we are grateful For your life and the families that grieve, like the Kinderis family this week. Lord, there's such mixed emotions. So much gratitude that Phil was able to fight this cancer for as long as he did, and they were able to enjoy his presence for that long. Such gratitude for his faith and for the knowledge that now he enjoys eternity with you. But also such grief that he's gone. The realization that now so much will change because so much of the family's life revolved around how he was doing. But you're a God who's in it with us for the long haul. And we're grateful for that, Lord. You don't just offer us eternity after we die, you walk with us. For good Gabriel as he waits to go home to you. For the confidence he has. But also your presence with the families. They got to celebrate his birthday this week. And now know that probably the next event that will draw them together will be a stream Lord, in the midst of that, you are with us. On these hot summer days when we complain about the heat and the humidity, forgive us because we know how soon we'll be complaining about it being too cold. Lord, we're not an easy people to please, and yet you're a God who continues to bless us. So receive our thanks this day. Receive our gratitude. Receive our praise for just being who you are. And now as we open up your word, Lord, teach us about what it means to live a life of praise. Not just when we gather and worship, but each day of our lives, so that we can truly be your people. Speak to us by your Spirit, for we ask you in the name of Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
scripture this morning comes from Psalm 33. The psalmist writes, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise Him. Praise the Lord with the heart. Make music to Him on a ten-string lyre. Sing to Him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all He does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of His unfailing love. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of His mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere Him. For He spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of His heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all humankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is in His unfailing love, to deliver them from death, to keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May Your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in You. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the words of our God abide forever. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. Did you do that this morning? Did you sing? Did you sing with joy? Or if you don't want others to hear your voice, did you at least have that joy in your heart bubbling up? I love the fact that the psalmist calls us to sing joyfully. Not to sing beautifully, but joyfully. If he said sing beautifully, people like me would just have to keep our mouth shut. But when he says sing joyfully, we can all do that. We can participate in this. And to do it is a choice. We can decide to ignore it, but we can also choose to do it. It's not based on the circumstances around us. It's based on the relationship with God within us. But the psalmist isn't just talking to us when we gather here for worship. Do you practice this on a daily basis? Do you live with joy in your heart? Do you live with gratitude in your heart? If you do, then sing joyfully, even if it's only on the inside, but do it. And if you don't, then start to practice this. Here's a challenge. Every morning, when you wake up, five things for which you're grateful. Five aspects of God's character that you appreciate. Just take a moment before you get going in the day and start it with gratitude. If you want to sing it, sing it. If you've got a song in your heart, let it flow. If it's in the shower, wherever it is. Or if it's just in your heart, start with gratitude. Because it can make a huge difference in every day of your life. If you start every day with gratitude, then you're going to see the rest of that day through the filter of gratitude, of joy, of praise. And if you don't, then you're going to let the circumstances just kind of close in around you, and you're going to miss out on so much. Why do we do this? Some of says because it's appropriate. Because it's the most natural thing for a Christ follower to want to do is to say thanks, to say you're a good God, and I praise you, and I worship you for that. He says, it's fitting for the upright to praise Him. It's what we ought to do. But it's also commanded here. Look at these, these words, these verbs that are in the imperative form. Praise Him, make music, sing, play, shout. Again, not all of us can do all of these. I can't play an instrument skillfully. 
I can't sing beautifully, but I can praise Him. I can shout to Him. I can express my gratitude to Him. What we're told here, this is an option. There are plenty of mornings where we're going to wake up and say, well, I don't feel like it today. I had a bad night. I didn't sleep well. I know what's coming. I know all the stress of today. I'm just not in the mood for, for singing. Do it anyway. Do it consistently enough so that you will start to want to do it. Because you will know how good it is and what a blessing it gives to you. <coughs> do what the psalmist commands. Now the reason for doing it is that it clears our perspective for living. If we start every day focused on God with gratitude and praise, we will be reminded every day that He's in charge and we are not. <coughs> Sometimes we've got to remember that because it's very easy for us to think we're in control of everything. We have to try to be in charge. No, God is. We simply have to do what he calls us to do. We have to live as his people. And when we start with praise, it's a good reminder. He's on his throne, so I don't have to try to climb up there and take it away from him. I can let him be God. What this sound really is, it's just a whole list of reasons why we praise him. We praise Him because the Word of the Lord is right and true. That's accurate about this book, the Bible, the written Word of God. It's accurate. It's true. It's reliable. It's dependable. It gives us clear principles for living. It gives us the guidance we want. It's accurate in everything it intends to teach us about how to live as God's people. It's so deep that we can study it all our lives and we never really get to the depth that we can mine out. But it's also so simple in the major principles that a child can pick it up and read it and understand. That's the beauty of this word. It's true and right in everything. But that phrase that the word of the Lord is right and true is also accurate of the living word, Jesus Christ. That same description fits him. Jesus Christ is an accurate description of what God is like. Jesus said to his followers, and he says to us, if you want to know what my father is like, then watch me. Examine my life. Listen to my words. Consider my attitudes. Because you will know what the father is like by watching me. Jesus is a right and true representation of God the Father. Why do we praise Him? Because He's faithful in all that He does. He's faithful to His own character and His purposes. God is incapable of contradicting Himself. God is incapable of sabotaging His own purposes, His will. He can't do that. He's always consistent. He's always faithful. But he's also faithful to the people he's chosen for himself. And who are those people? You and me, if we live by faith. God's chosen people initially were the descendants of Abraham by race. But Jesus Christ opens it to all of us. It says if we are people of faith, we are descendants of Abraham in the spiritual sense. So we are God's chosen ones. And that means he is faithful to us. We praise Him because the Lord loves righteousness and justice. Those terms are often combined in Scripture and they're, they're really intertwined and interchangeable, if you will. They mean giving both to God and to man that which is their due. That's righteousness. That's justice. And it reminds us that our praise not only has a vertical dimension with God, it also has a horizontal dimension. We can't praise God and ignore the humans that he's placed around us. But neither can we do all these wonderful things for humans and ignore God. Righteousness and justice demands both of these. And because God loves righteousness and justice, ultimately they will be carried out. Now, he would prefer to have these carried out through us. But you'll see that they get carried out in spite of us if necessary because God's will will be done. Why do we praise Him? Because the earth is full of His unfailing love. It's so easy for us to miss that. 
It's so easy for us not to have eyes to see. If you had a chance to read my box in the bulletin, you know that two weekends from now, I'm gonna, my message will be an interview of Shannon Savage. For those of you who don't know, two years ago, Shannon's husband, Mark, was killed when a tornado flipped the camper that the family was camping in and it crushed it. So many times I've spent a couple hours with Shannon talking through what we're going to do this week. She said so many times people said to me, because it was the only camper touched by that tornado in the whole campground. And people said, oh, Shannon, you were just at the wrong place at the wrong time. She said, no, I don't see it that way anymore. Now I understand I was in the right place at the right time. Because God was with us. She said, I didn't think I'd ever be able to go back to that campground. She said, I've gone back on the first anniversary and the second anniversary, and it's become a beautiful place for me. Because God was there with us. I know that now. I know he was with us. See, that's having eyes to see that God's unfailing love is with us, even in the incredible tragedies of life. Jan sees that. She gets it. But so should we. We are the ones that God intends to make that love tangible. It's when others look at how we handle life, they should see God's love flowing in us and flowing through us. Not just because life goes the way we want it to, but because we understand God is with us even when life isn't going the way we want. Exhibit A for God in terms of His love is us, His people. He places us in strategic places in this world so that when people see how we reflect His love, They'll come to see his love and experience it as well. We praise him because he's given us the gift of creation. The psalmist kind of parallels the Genesis account of creation. God created by his word. He spoke and it came to be. The psalmist talks about the starry host in the heavens. He talks about God having the waters of the lakes and the oceans in jars. He gives you a picture of how how magnificent and how big God is. He's got jars big enough to hold the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. And when it was time to create, he just kind of poured them out. Again, he's using poetic language here to try to say, do you understand how magnificent, how great, how awesome this God is? And that leads him to say, let all the people of the world revere him. So when you're having experience of creation, let it lead you to praise. Whether it's a day at the beach and you're relaxing, or a day on the ski slopes in the wintertime, whether you're digging in the dirt in your garden and you're all sweaty and dirty and you're just loving it because you enjoy that, take time to say thanks, God. Take time to revere Him for His creation. But also understand that one of the ways we're called to praise Him is to take care of this creation. He didn't give it to us and say, now, trash it if you want to. He gave it to us and says, I have put you as managers, as stewards of my creation. So take care of it. Be good to it. Enjoy it, appreciate it, and manage it well. Why do we praise him? Because the plans and the purposes of God endure forever. The psalmist reminds us that God foils the plans of nations. You don't have to be an intense student of history to understand God does that. Look at the great Babylonian Empire, the great Roman Empire. Where are they today? Are we arrogant enough to think that someday, centuries down the road, people won't look back and say that great American Empire? What happened? If we get so full of ourselves and think we're such a great nation all because we've made ourselves that way, God will do the same thing. Because he can foil human plans and his will will be done. God gets his way. And no matter how powerful a nation, it can't stand in his way. But he also chooses to bless the people he's chosen for himself. That's us right now. His chosen people, his people of faith. That's cause for great humility 
not pride. We're his chosen ones because of who God is, not because of who we are. You want to be humble about being one of God's chosen ones. Read the scriptures. Look at the people God chooses. They're usually the misfits. He says to Israel, I didn't pick you because you were a great nation. I picked you because you were the most pitiful people on earth. You had nothing going for you. God often chooses leaders that way. The ones that everybody else overlooks. So the fact that we're his chosen one leads us to humility. It's cause for worship, not for apathy. See, we so easily fall into the same trap Israel did. God said to Israel, I will bless you so you can be my blessing to the nations. Israel put a period after, I will bless you. They said, well, God's going to bless us. We're his chosen one. We're his favorites. We're the best. And they looked down their nose at everybody else. And they failed to be his blessing. And we, the church, could fall into that same trap and say, well, we're God's chosen people. He's going to bless us. He's blessed us so that we can be his blessing to others. Why do we praise him? Because from heaven the Lord looks down and sees all humankind. Some years ago, Bette Midler made popular this song, From a Distance. From a distance, God is watching us. As if God is distant from us. As if God is impersonal. As if he's detracted. If once in a while he looks over just to see what we're doing, but that's it. No. No, scriptures tell us that God is intimately acquainted with each one of us. That's highlighted by sending His Son, Jesus Christ, into this world to live with us, to live among us, to be one of us. And when Christ ascended back to heaven, His promise is, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone. I will send my Spirit to live with you, to guide you, to teach you, to encourage you, to comfort you. My presence will be within each one of you. I care about you that much. And so we praise Him. We praise Him because He's not threatened by any national power or any armaments. He says, no king can be saved by the size of his army. What a warning to us who are so convinced that our security is built on the basis of whether or not we can stockpile enough weapons, whether we have more nuclear armaments than anybody else. That's our security. God said, don't get ahead of yourself. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance, despite its great strength. When most of the battles were fought by foot soldiers, a horse was a huge advantage. God said, just because you got a lot of horses, don't get overconfident. Just because you've got a lot of nuclear stockpile, don't get arrogant. I'm in charge. You're not. Remember that. We praise Him because the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him. The context here is protection and care. I am with you. I will walk with you. I will care for you. I will watch over you. That's the kind of God we have. And so the psalmist concludes with these three statements. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. We don't wait for circumstances to improve. We wait for the Lord. We wait with patience. We wait with confidence. Even though the evidence seems to be that God has forgotten us at times, we wait and we trust Him. He's our protection and shield for all of eternity. Nothing will separate us from his love. He promises that. And so in him, our hearts rejoice, <clears throat> for we trust in his holy name. Isn't that the crux of the matter? Do we trust in his holy name? Do we dare to believe that his promises are true? Do we dare to rest ourselves on his character? Trust the Lord only. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O oh Lord, as we put our hope in you. That's a prayer. God, we're going to pray for your unfailing love. We're going to put our hope in you. But it is a hope. It's a prayer with confidence. We expect this to come true. 
that we expect God's blessings, not because we deserve it, but because He's promised those blessings. And if we live with that hope, with that prayer, with that expectation, then how can we not praise Him? I leave you with a prescription today. I didn't think of it in time, or I probably would have tried to create my own little prescription pad. Here's the prescription. One dose of praise every morning. One dose of praise. What will it do for you? It will improve your attitude. If you start your day with praise, you are far more likely to live your day with praise. It will influence all of your day. It will improve your appearance. If you start the day with praise, you're far more likely to live your day with a smile. And there's nothing that can improve your appearance better than a warm, inviting smile, a confident smile. Because you know you've got a God that loves you and that God's on the throne, so no matter what happens, it's going to be okay. Because He's with you. It's guaranteed to improve your spiritual health. It will strengthen your spiritual bones. It will give you a stronger spiritual constitution for all of life. If you begin every day with praise. And it's just good for overall health improvement. Uh, I'm not a doctor, even though I'm playing one this morning. But <laughs> if you start your day with praise, my guess is it's going to lower your blood pressure. You've got an ulcer, it'll calm your ulcer down. There's so much that it will do for you physically because you're starting your day with God. You're starting it with praise. So every morning, whether you think you need it or not, take a dose of praise. Spend a few moments thanking God, focusing on His character, praising Him for who He is, for what He's done. Start your day every day that way. And trust God to make the difference. Father, this is easy for me to say, but it's not easy for us to do. Some mornings we wake up, we wake up and we haven't slept well. We're still focused on a fight we had with a family member the night before. We're worried about what's going to happen at work and all the stress and the strain. We wake up thinking about the pile of bills and wonder how they're going to get paid. It's too hot and it's too cold. It doesn't rain enough, it rains too much. Lord, we're people who can complain so easily. you give us the prescription for that. Prescription of praise. You don't just invite us to take this. You command us to engage in activities that will lead us to rejoice. To engage in activities that will filter our perspective through a reminder that you are in charge and you love us. So Lord, give us the self-discipline to do this to wake up and to say thanks, to wake up and to praise you, to wake up and sing a song, a celebration to you. Holy Spirit, we can only do this if you help us. We're asking for that help.